nothing happened. Why don't you just say uh, something? All right, let's see if it's working now. Testing one, two, three, four. Well, Arthur, or perhaps I should say Mr. Arthur Stern, okay. President of the Board of Trustees of Rochester Institute of Technology. As I mentioned to you over the phone, I have started this, what I have called an oral history of the Institute, and have interviewed some of the older deans and department heads in order to get their recollections and reminiscences before these slip away. And I'm looking forward to this interview with a great deal of interest this morning because of the extremely important part that you played in the Institute during all of the 60s and right up to the present in the 70s. And in particular, I would be interested if you would just sketch for me as if I were a newcomer to Rochester or certainly newcomer to RIT, uh, your early contacts with the Institute, how you happen to become interested, and how you happen to become uh, elected to the Board of Trustees and then to the Presidency. Well, I suppose, Leo, that uh, my first contact with the Institute arose because I was a close friend of Mark Ellingson's. Uh, and he, as you know, thought, lived, breathed, and slept RIT, and his enthusiasm was catching and I paid many a visit to RIT with Mark. Uh, thought it was a marvelous, fascinating, interesting institution. And when Mark asked me if I would like to serve on the Board of Trustees, I enthusiastically accepted. And that was in the late 50s? That sometime? was in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I served on the Board for about two or three years. Uh, before I was elected secretary of the board. And after that, when Mr. Gleason retired after a number of wonderful years as chairman, Mark and the board asked me if I would serve as chairman, and I became chairman in 1962. Good enough. Well, now this is interesting because your background is so completely different than most of the board members were at that time. And for example, most of them were industrialists. Correct. As, if I, as I remember correctly, you were a Princeton graduate. No, I was a Yale graduate. Yale graduate. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's a bad one, Leon. No. Yeah, Harvard Law, wasn't it? Harvard Law. Was Harvard Law. Mm -hmm. uh, but, of course, we were, and I was then, working uh, in my legal practice with many of the industrial institutions that were principal supporters of RIT. Well, when you came on to the board, of course, the Institute had moved into the baccalaureate degree granting and had done a little bit in the area of graduate work. Uh, but in the early 60s, certainly, the question of whether to remain down in the old third ward arose. And I know that you were right at the heart of all of that. Well, I think there were well, at least three or four principal reasons, which you will also remember vividly, uh, which were under consideration and which eventually persuaded us that we had to move out of our downtown situation. Perhaps the most important was the fact that our campus was going to be split in two by the new expressway. Uh, equally important, perhaps, was the fact that the area had deteriorated to such an extent that particularly our women students were afraid to go back to their dormitories at night sometimes. We also felt that there was need to expand our physical facilities to perform the job that we were expected to perform, not only for local business and industry, but more and more on a national and even international plane. And the only way we could go if we were going to expand facilities where we were was up, which didn't seem very uh, efficient. The city tried to persuade us that if we stayed where we were, they would raise all of the uh, almost slum area between RIT and the Clarissa Street Bridge, and that we could have any part of that property for new buildings that we might want. But when we tried to pin them down, they said, well, they thought they could accomplish it within 10 years, which didn't help us very much. Also. Uh, I think the influence, particularly, of Jim Gleason at this time was important. He kept reminding us that 
he had told the University of Rochester that they did not have sufficient real estate when they moved out to their new campus, and of course his prediction had been 100% true. And he told us that he thought that uh, if we were considering moving out of our present facilities in any way whatsoever, that we should get a minimum, as I remember his saying it, of a thousand acres and not settle for anything less. Uh, all of those considerations were considered back and forth and at many, many board meetings before the uh, decision was actually re reached. The students got very involved in this, too. Uh, one thing that was always of great interest to me during those various board meetings, because at that time Dr. Ellingson had asked the vice presidents to sit in on the board meetings. That's right. And at the uh, early discussions, there were a good many of the uh, old-timers on the board who were not at all in favor of the move, as I remember. They remembered it as Mechanics Institute and felt that the downtown location was a good location. And I thought that the way in which you and Mark Ellingson brought the board along was an outstanding example of good group dynamics here. Do you well, want to expand on that a little bit? I think that uh, there were really only two or three members of the board who were quite adamant about wanting us to stay in downtown Rochester. Uh, Gilbert McCurdy was number one in that group. Walter Todd was another. At the beginning, Fred Gordon was a third, but Fred later on said that he had been 100% wrong and that he was very happy that the decision had been reached to move, which he thought was the right thing to do. Uh, there was concern, I suppose, that we were no longer going to be a shirt sleeve institution. This is the same sort of concern that has been expressed whenever we talked about a baccalaureate degree. You know more about that than perhaps anybody else. And, uh, but I think the great majority of the board felt that we had to uh, change with the times of the fact that we were now offering baccalaureate degrees and some graduate degrees uh, didn't detract from the fact that we were still a shirt sleeve institution, but that in business and industry required this kind of education for their people, which they hadn't 20, 30 years ago. So when the vote was finally taken, although I guess it was not unanimous as I remember, there were only one or two. I think there were only two against and one abstention mm -hmm. as I remember it. Uh, so that it, and this was polling uh, everybody on the board at that time. So that vote uh, took place in, was it November or December 61? I can't place the exact month. I do remember, though, one thing that was very interesting was that the students were tremendously interested and wanted us very much to move, and they had some representatives with walkie-talkies outside of the boardroom. <laughs> I've forgotten that. And uh, that when, when the vote had finally been taken, uh, we went out of the boardroom and told these representatives about it. And you could hear the yells and screams of the students all over the, uh, all over the campus of approval of what had been done. And as I remember, the next morning, there also was an impromptu meeting out there in what the, yeah, was the Veterans Court. That was tremendously, uh, I think, important. The students asked Mark and me to meet with them in the students' court, and they made the first contribution toward the new campus, raised from the students themselves a check for ten thousand dollars, which I think was is simply great. Uh, well, of course, during the period following World War II, the Rochester industrial picture had changed too as you probably know far better than I, but from what had been primarily companies that locally owned had changed to where many of them were now parts of conglomerates. Uh, you want to comment on that a little bit, and the effect that might have had on the institute? Well, I, <clears throat> I'm not so sure, Leo, that, that this affected, the fact that the companies had changed affected us so much because our role was still to provide skilled people in the various areas for whatever industries were working in Rochester, and whether, for instance, it was a, a uh, branch of General Motors or whether it was Eastman Kodak Company. 
uh, one being local and the other not, we still had the same uh, requirements as far as the education of the people was concerned. I think it may have had two other effects, though. One was the question of support, financial, and the other was a broadening of our base, both in searching out what was needed as far as industry is concerned, and secondly, in seeking support on a more national basis. And if we were going to become more and more national, we must we must get away from only an associate degree, I suppose, which had an effect on that. Yes. Um, I know that uh, <clears throat> occasionally Mark has said that it's a little more difficult uh, for some of these nationally owned companies to get the local branches to uh, contribute financially, take a little more work than uh, when they're locally owned. Uh, another thing that uh, you may remember is that certain studies were made prior to the final decision also with regard to what was the attitude of the alumni, the faculty, students, and all. Well, I think everyone was, Mark particularly, he did a great deal of, uh, of this. He, he wanted to be, he felt strongly, particularly the faculty's viewpoint was essential as to what should be done. And I'm sure that you had a great part in making that and finding out what that situation was. The alumni were polled. Uh, the community, although there was no formal polling, we went around to certainly the key industrialists uh, who weren't on our board and talked to them about it. Uh, I think that the consensus was, with some exceptions, that though they felt strongly that it was too bad for the city of Rochester for RIT to move out, that we probably had no alternative. Uh, I think, although you can answer this better than I do, my recollection is that the faculty was by and large highly enthusiastic yes, very about much so. it. Very much so. uh, as we've said, the students certainly were. As I remember another rather informal study was made of other institutions that have been faced with a similar problem where they've been located in a downtown urban area. Should they move or should not they move? And uh, all of those that had stayed were unhappy. I remember Drexel was particularly yes. one of those yes. I think that had stayed and, and, uh, had wished, and wished that they had not. So that, uh, that was another uh, strong wind there. Well, of course, once the decision was made to move, then the question arose as to what are the financial requirements going to be here. Well, even before that, the question was, where are we going to move to? Right. Uh, and this posed a number of problems because we didn't want to be too far away from the downtown area. And yet we had uh, Mr. Gleason's <coughs> instructions to get at least a thousand acres of property and we had as I recall it we almost succeeded in buying some property I think it was along French Road or not French Road West but uh, Westfall Road yeah. uh, and this we were all kept up about getting and it fell through and then Mark uh, very secretly and with some help from outside, put together in small packages at one time the, the property that we now have, and which totals some 1,300 acres. And I don't think that the owners of the property from whom we got the options to buy actually knew who was buying it or what was happening until we had the whole package put together. Yeah. Well, that was a marvelous thing to get that. It was bounded by Jefferson Road on the north, and let's see, River Road on the west. On the west, a John Street on the east, and uh, Bailey, Bailey it is on the south. south. Right. And there were a few pieces that jutted into this property that we weren't able to buy. Since that time, I think, uh, with only a very few exceptions, we have rounded out the whole thing. Uh, as I remember, it wasn't there another interesting telephone call shortly after the decision had been made to move from Dr. Williams suggesting that we establish a nursery. 
That was one of the greatest things that ever happened, I think. Uh, of course, he was a great horticulturist. Uh, and he told us that we would be very uh, sorry if we didn't do something about trees, that uh, obviously we wouldn't have a campus built for some five or six years, and that lots could happen to trees in five or six years. So we set aside a very sizable piece of property in one corner of our acreage and planted hundreds and hundreds of various species of relatively small trees, which we have now replanted all over the campus, and it was a great, great move. Certainly saved thousands and thousands of dollars, and got a head start also on the right. growth of these. Uh, so then, the, as I remember, there was quite a uh, discussion about the architectural firms that would be chosen and how they would be chosen and all. Perhaps you could well, we decided initially that the project was probably too big a one for one architect. I'm not sure that was a correct decision. Uh, I think if we were doing it all over again, that uh, we might look around for one architect that was qualified to do it. But anyway, our theory then was that it was, should be divided among perhaps five architects. And we started with a list of what we considered to be 75 of the outstanding architects in the country. Uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt Webb was a tremendous help to us in, in this connection, as were many others. Don McMaster was very much involved, uh, others who had experience in these fields. We finally <coughs> narrowed the 75 down to 20, and then the 20 down to 10. Uh, and over a long, what seemed like a long period, we took the 10 and had a group of the first five and then the second five, if the first five didn't accept. And we uh, expected that probably a number of the first five wouldn't accept because they were all prima donnas and the idea of working with somebody else might not appeal to them. But to our great uh, pleasure, every one of the first five selected accepted. And in this connection, I think one of the most fun and amusing things that happened was the first meeting of the five architects which I attended, where we uh, explained that we wanted their own individual stamp on the areas which they were going to build, but that obviously the entire campus had to tie in. And the five architects then started talking among each other, and <laughs> in about half an hour they were all telling the other that they didn't know anything about architecture, that they were a bunch of dopes, <laughs> uh, and that each had his own ideas and the others didn't know what they were talking about. Well, by the end of about two hours they were all friends and they had decided that they could work together. <laughs> That's good. Well, of course, concurrently with this, there has been discussion about the need for a new campus fund drive. Right. And uh, as I remember, the goal was set there and plans were undertaken to uh, start that. Do you want to uh, remember well, we, that? Uh, we got two, we did this in two ways. First of all, we, we, we uh, had to determine exactly what buildings we planned to build. Uh, and then we had to get estimates in connection with, with this. This was a long, quite a long process because it involved particularly the faculty and the staff of RIT who had to decide what educational facilities were needed, what recreational, what dormitory, so on. And we then determined what we could borrow, or what we thought we could borrow, from uh, the dormitory authority, and in the first instance, this was to be on a self-liquidating basis, like dormitory, student union, and so on. That changed later. And the balance, well, then also there was what we thought we might be able to sell parts of the old campus for. Uh, and the balance came to some $19 million, slightly less. And we decided that we, there was no alternative but to mount a capital campaign for $19 million, which was about twice the size of any campaign that had ever been 
mounted in the Rochester area up to that time. Uh, and over a period of a couple of years before we were successful, we raised it, which was, uh, I think, a great feat. I think another thing that was highly important in this connection was that before we were finished with this campus, which was the neighborhood, but the initial was in the neighborhood of $60 million, we were less than a million dollars off on our initial estimates. That's amazing. I which is all credit to Mark Ellis. I was trying to remember the, uh, the firm that was brought in to assist with the organization of the fund drive. Uh, yeah. I'll think of it in one minute. Well, let's go on to something else. We'll come back to it. Uh, Brown, uh, there was a Brown in it. Uh, well, we'll probably think of it. Yeah. I didn't jot it down anywhere. The, um, I remember during the design and then as we got underway with the construction, there were all sorts of problems and frustrations, uh, sorts of things that I guess in any large construction project you run into. But uh, I remember one that Dr. Allington comments on, uh, he commented on quite forcefully at the time, is where the ice rink and the gym had one long brick wall that must be almost 100 yards long, it right. seems like. Someone suggested that they needed expansion joints in this brick wall. The architect said, no, they need an expansion joint. <laughs> by the time it was up, the first winter and the first summer went by, here was a large crack, crack going it. down diagonal. That's right. And that's, uh, of course, you never know what to do in situations like that. Another one that I've always felt badly about was that you were supposed to be able to have a complete view from the dormitories all the way to the College of Engineering, through mm -hmm. that alley. Uh, and the architects who built the College Union moved it about five feet out so that a corner of it completely blocked that view going down. Well, we didn't realize that this was happening because the, there were scaffolds that were out all the time. When the scaffolds came down, we discovered what had happened, but by this time the building was built. What could you do? We wondered whether we should sue the architect or what damages can we get. But it, it's been a great disappointment because we hoped that you could look from one end to the other and see two beautiful pieces of sculpture that are at those ends uh, and get that vista. Well, you can't. That kind of disappointment, I think, happens in a project of that size. Another statistic I remember is the number of bricks that were ordered from the... Uh, That's right. Uh, and I, I think I somewhere around here I used to have a little... Uh, a little. There it is over there on that table. And oh, maybe, yeah. maybe it has the number of bricks right on it. I'm not sure. <clears throat> That's correct. Uh, a miniature of one of more than 7,500,000 bricks used in the construction of the RIT campus. And this is cast in plastic. That's here. right. <laughs> Use it as a paperweight sometimes. There you go. So then there were all sorts of other things, of course, as the campus was finished and we started to move in. Some of the plumbing wasn't connected up where it should be connected. That's right. And we had prop particular problems in the dormitories with the students and so on. Uh, and we had, unfortunately, of course, when you are building with dormitory authority money, you don't have the same right to choose your contractors that you do if you are simply using your own money. Uh, and so we had to take the lowest bidder among contractors, and of course there were different contractors in different areas. but. In particular, the Graphic Arts Building and the Student Union area, which both of which were done by the same contractor, were tremendous headaches. He was uh, poor, mm -hmm. and this meant uh, being on his back all the time. It cost us a great deal of money, I think, because of his delays and his errors. Fortunately, I think the best architect that we had among the five, Hugh Stubbins, was involved in most of that, and uh, 
he was a tremendous help working with a poor contractor to get things done. In contrast, there were other contractors who were good and where the, where the buildings went up in good shape. Well, then it was a great day when we moved out there. I believe that was the fall of 68. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, moved in and started the shakedown cruise. There was another thing that happened during the uh, middle part of the 60s, Arthur, that uh, has become an extremely important part of the Institute of Life now, and that is the NTID. Well, that was, that was a fascinating thing, Leo. The, this was first brought to our attention. Hetty Shumway telephoned both Mark and me and said that she'd like to come out and talk with us. And we met with her in Mark's office. And she told us about some legislation that had just been passed by the Congress in which they were going to establish the first technical institute for the deaf on the college level. And that uh, she thought that we should become interested in it and there was an opportunity for those colleges and universities that were interested to file applications for, uh, for this institute. We, uh, we brought this to the board, and I remember, the, which is quite interesting, the first meeting of the board, the feeling was, well, sure, file it. We haven't got a chance of getting it anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> what have we got to lose? <laughs> so what have we got to lose? Well, when Mark and I'm sure you and others got through putting together an application, uh, we all got quite enthusiastic about it, and the feeling wasn't that we're filing it because we know we can't get it. We're filing it and damn it, we're gonna try and get it. And we went back to the board and said, now look, we're not going to file this application on the basis of it's just a meaningless act. If we file it, we're going to do everything we possibly can to get this and unless you're willing to have us do it, stop it right now. Well, the board decided that yes, this was something we should do. And as you know, uh, eventually we were selected. As I remember, there were about 30 institutions that originally put in the program. There were at least that many. It finally boiled down to five uh, that were the last ones, which were thoroughly, thoroughly investigated by the committee that was Came charged with it. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I remember that. Duke was one of those, the University of Illinois, I think the University of Louisiana, but I'm not sure about that. I was under the impression it might have been Tennessee. Tennessee, I think you're right. Was Pittsburgh in there? And Pittsburgh was in there. And, uh, and RIT. And the last two, I think, that were, I think we and the University of Illinois were the, were the finalists. <laughs> that was very interesting. We're coming down somewhere near the end of this tape. We'll sort of have to watch that and then right. turn it over. But uh, wasn't the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, wasn't this one of the original desires of President Johnson? At least he, I, did, uh, he signed the bill. He signed the bill. He, as I understand it, he did have in his family somewhere uh, deafness. Mm -hmm. I think he, his, his very, very close friends were Judge and Mrs. Thornberry. Mrs. Thornberry, of course, is now on our board. Uh, and uh, Judge Thornberry was at one point nominated by Johnson for the Supreme Court, but in the whole Fortis situation, his nomination had to be withdrawn. But they did, the, the uh, Thornberrys had, I think, parents who were deaf, and I guess that they were quite instrumental in, in, in interesting the president in this whole field. Uh, so that it was a pet project, I think, for President Johnson, but encouraged in this way. Well, that was certainly interesting. And then, uh, as I remember it, uh, Dr. Frazina, Robert Frazina, was selected as uh, director of NTID, and he came board in the late 60s. Late 60s, well, in about the middle 60s, didn't he, Leo? Uh, and he was 
I think we were tremendously fortunate. I think if Bob had stayed at Gallaudet, he would have been the head of that. Yes. But the challenge of this was was wonderful, and he took this job. Certainly done a marvelous job. That marvelous. Absolutely wonderful. Well, I think we better stop this right now and right. turn it over. Came on just a very small group at first, and then that group has built up now to where. Uh, Approximately 600 of them, I believe. And That's right, and I guess we will get to the 750 that we're talking about very soon. Yes, that's uh, planned, and certainly the new facilities are marvelous. But of course, another extremely important thing in the life of the Institute in the late 60s is the fact that uh, Mark Ellingson announced his intention to retire. This was a great shocker to all of us, because RIT and Mark Ellingson were really synonymous. Uh, Correct. But we felt that we had to bow to Mark's wishes after the years that he had served. And of course, Mark was also uh, having physical problems with his hip and had a great deal of pain. Uh, and it was very interesting, because Mark had talked to me quite privately over a period of some three or four years about the fact that he wanted to retire and that certainly once the new campus was finished this was going to be the appropriate time for it and that we should keep our eyes open to see if there was anybody that we ran across whom we thought might be someone we'd like to be interested in. Well I remember once that I went down to Washington in connection with the drawing of the contract for NTID. And I went in to meet a man who was then the Assistant Secretary for Education, of Health, Education, and Welfare, a man named Dr. Paul Miller. And I was tremendously impressed with him, thought he was a fine person. And very shortly after that, he came to Rochester to inspect our IT connection with this NTID matter. And Mark was equally impressed. And I recall that after Dr. Miller left, almost uh, simultaneously, Mark and I turned to each other and said, there's a man we ought to consider as far as the future president of uh, RIT is concerned. Well, for that reason, Mark suggested that I go to Washington and talk to Paul Miller. Uh, without making any commitments, just sounding him out. So I went to Washington and told Paul that uh, Mark was going to retire in the next year or two, or immediately if this seemed advisable, and that we wondered if he would be interested at all in considering RIT and coming up and talking to us. Paul told me that uh, he had decided that he was through with administrative jobs, <laughs> that he uh, had been offered uh, a distinguished pr professorship at North Carolina, and that he was getting back to his first love, which was teaching. And uh, though he was tremendously flattered, and if he ever did do any administrative work, RIT was the kind of place he wanted to go to, this was a firm decision. So I, very disappointed, came back. Mark then decided that the time had come to fix a date for retiring. We actually engaged uh, a, an agency to help us look for somebody. And if I can interrupt here for one second, Leo, I remember the name of the uh, group that helped us on the campaign. Oh, it was Tamlin and Brown. <laughs> Anyway, go on with this. Uh, we told these people who were helping us that they should go down and talk to Paul Miller, not with any idea that we were going to be able to get Paul, but that we thought he would be able to give us the names of some people who should be investigated as possible uh, people for the job. And they went down and saw Paul, and he gave them the names of several people. Quite interestingly, one of them, one of the names was Todd Bullard, 
who is now the provost, mm -hmm. vice president and provost of RIT, uh, saying at the time that he was very young but very able. Well, they came back and told me, the, this, the uh, professional consultants, that as they had left Paul Miller's office, he had made a remark that perhaps I'd be interested in. And the remark was that, damn it, he had thought he was coming to North Carolina to teach, and he found that he was completely involved in administrative work. That was all Paul had said. Well, I was not, about five minutes later, was on the telephone with Paul and reminded him of what he had said to me. And he said, well, he was not going to come to Rochester unless he was really interested in considering the position here. And he let me know if the time ever came when he wanted to visit. Well, about a month later, he called and said, you want me to come up and see you? And he came several times with Francina. Uh, we had him meet, as you remember, faculty, students, alumni, and he was the unanimous choice of everyone. Although we did, during this period of time, interview some at least five or six others. Heard of them, yeah. uh, and finally, Paul Miller decided that he would accept the position. I think it was one of the most fortunate things that's happened to RIT in a long time. It was a great choice. Marvelous. Well, of course, as uh, Paul came on, I believe he came in the fall of 69. That's right. And uh, shortly thereafter, why, there was the student unrest over the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. uh, some campuses did literally blow up. Others looked like they might blow up. And I can remember some very uneasy days on the RIT campus, particularly just after the Kent State right. uh, killing. Uh, you you were in on some of that too, I'm sure. Well, I think that the fact that not only Paul, but you were involved too, Leo, all of the administrative people, some of the trustees, uh, got out among the students went to the dorms, uh, let them scream at us and, and tell their trouble, blow off their steam. Paul, I know, Paul Miller was, was there almost every single night, spent many nights actually sleeping in the dormitory. Uh, Francina did the same thing, and this I think at some time might even have been considered a little bit dangerous to do, but she insisted on it. And I think this is why we came out of this as well as we did without any real disruptions and with perhaps, uh, well, Paul has pointed out to me a number of times since then, he, he's, he turned to somebody and said, now this was one of our most radical students, and, here is, and now he is probably one of the most responsible people on the campus, or later on, he came pointed out one who came back for an alumni day and he's got a very responsible position somewhere in, in, in the kind of work he wants to do. I think this had a big effect in bringing even the then so-called radical students around to thinking that maybe there was a different way of approaching things than throwing bombs or blowing it up. Blowing it up. Yes, I remember one meeting in the boardroom up on the seventh floor there, uh, Dr. Miller and students. And uh, this was an afternoon of extreme tension. There were rumors that there was dynamite on the campus, and the dynamite was to be used that night. Uh, I do remember that that same evening we came back and there was a candle light march that started over in the residence hall. I remember that. And went clear around the campus into the building and back to the residence halls. And Paul Miller spent literally three to four hours there with the uh, tie off just answering the violent questions that the students were raising. But it did, uh, in part at least, diffuse the attention. I'm sure it did. It was a wonderful, wonderfully handled situation. Really was. And he's, <coughs> Paul is, is uh, I think, respected beyond almost 
Well, Mark was too, but I'm yeah. talking about other other institutions respected beyond anybody that I know of by the students. He's not an easy mark. No. I mean respected and not just a pushover. Mm -hmm. they, they think he's fair, uh, that their problems will be considered, maybe not decided always the way they want them decided, but they'll be considered. considered. Yes, and uh, under uh, Dr. Miller's leadership, there has been a broadening of student and faculty participation in administration. Correct. I think this was, after all, Leo, as you remember, when we were down in the downtown area, uh, we were a relatively closely knit group. We were geographically shoved together entirely. We were smaller by a lot. Uh, and this was a situation where one or two or three people could pretty well run the institute. Uh, when you moved out to the new campus with all of its problems, plus growth, plus everything else, it was more than any one person could any longer handle. It had to, a lot of work had to be delegated along different lines. And of course, there was a period when you were particularly Paul Miller's right-hand man doing this, and you know how this worked out and how the work had to be delegated and was to others. But it was an interesting change in the entire uh, sort of philosophy of administration. That's right. Uh, it was in part uh, brought about by our move and in part the changing times. The, uh, the students and the faculty demanded more of the... Uh, and justifiably, well, justifiably, I think. Justifiably, and I think it was handled uh, remarkably well by Dr. Miller. So I think to explore just a little bit different aspect here, because of your background and your interest in arts and music and all, uh, what do you picture as the impact that the community has made on RIT and the impact that RIT has made on the community over the years? Well, I think that over the years, up to fairly recently, the impact that RIT has made on the community and vice versa has been more in the technical areas, uh, in business, industry, photography, training, training of people for jobs. Uh, I think that more and more, and it's probably started initially with the School for American Craftsmen, but then the further we've done more and more development of the College of Fine and Applied Arts. RIT is becoming uh, known for in this particular field, and as a matter of fact, in connection with the current campaign that we're involved in, there has been a great deal of interest in professorships yeah. in that particular college, which I think indicates uh, a, not only a broadening of RIT's role, but an influence that we've got on the community insofar as art and uh, artistic endeavors are concerned. Uh, things like the Carey Collection in the, in the uh, library yeah. of rare books is also uh, known around not only in Rochester, perhaps better known outside That's of right. Rochester. So that I think we are definitely expanding our influence on Rochester, and people of Rochester are finding RIT more interesting to them than other fields. I think one thing in this connection that ought to be mentioned, we've talked an awful lot about the new campus, but I know that Paul Miller and the Board of Trustees feel very strongly that we should never lose our downtown relationship. And of course, we do have 50 Main Street West. Uh, we are giving a great deal of consideration to the question of whether we should renovate the old Clark building, but and give up 50 Main and, play, and, and substitute the Clark building for it. But whatever decision is made along those lines, I am certain that we will always have a downtown uh, facility and perhaps it may become larger and larger as time goes on. It's important to it. Yeah. 
Well, certainly the, the number of uh, different uh, curriculums offered has uh, expanded rather markedly, too, in the last uh, Tremendously, and I admit that uh, part of this is obviously the, the times, the demand of the times. I think that uh, both Paul Miller, Todd Bullard, have been very innovative in considering today uh, new areas of, of interest. Of course, uh, there are some obvious ones, like computers, computer sciences, but uh, business administration has become a, a social work and, is and police work. Police even, work yeah. uh, and there is a great deal. Well, we, we're starting now uh, uh, something in the, for, I think, Oculus mm -hmm. in the area of, or optometrist, perhaps it is, uh, and in the whole field of paramedical. Yeah. There's a biomedical photography major. That's right. Uh, these things that are, that are being demanded by industry, business, and so forth, just as when you were heading the academic end of RIT, the demand came for baccalaureate degrees and some new areas then. All right, we're, we're, we're meeting those demands today as we did when you were there. Mm -hmm. The one thing we haven't commented on here, and it was extremely important, and I think that uh, uh, Paul Miller and Todd Bullard and uh, Jim Buckholz, the other people have done a marvelous job. That is working out of a financial crunch that we were in. Well, that, that to me is a miracle. Uh, of course, when when we were down at the new campus, I mean, uh, excuse me, at the old campus, uh, Mark Ellingson would come, as you remember, to board meetings, and he would say, well, we have ended the year with a surplus of so much, and what are we going to spend it, or what are we going to do with it? So that... Uh, the Board of Trustees never had any concerns at all about finances. That we just left this to, to Mark, who is a wizard in this connection. Anyhow, Certainly. and our great worries were, what were we going to do with the extra money that we had? When we moved out to the new campus, we, of course, not only assumed tremendous additional expenses, but uh, we had a debt of some three to four million dollars a year that had to be paid off in principal as well as interest. And of course operating that new campus was a major thing. Uh, very frankly, I think when we moved out, and I'm sure Mark would be the first to admit this, the old methods of uh, finance control were not adequate for the new, for the new campus. Uh, Frank Benz, who was then our financial man, had been completely involved with the building of the new campus and just didn't have time to do much else. And when Paul Miller came in, our finances were in one terrible mess. The first year that he was there, I think we had a deficit of something over $3 million. Uh, Paul and Jim Buckholz, without uh, lessening the services that were performed by RIT, and in accordance with a plan which Paul announced shortly after he became president, he said, within three years, we must have a balanced budget or you better get another administrator. Well, in less than three years, he balanced this budget without additional funds. We're now seeking additional funds for other purposes, but the whole financial situation was turned around, uh, and Jim Buckholz deserves tremendous credit for this, too. But it was, it's just miraculous. Well, that's right. I think that the laying out of a long-range plan, then, and updating that yeah. each year has certainly been a, a, a tremendous step, and it's just amazing how they were able to eliminate that deficit. Fantastic. Well, Arthur, as you look ahead from the standpoint of the not only the RIT picture of education, but the national picture, there has been in the last few years sort of a disenchantment with higher education. More and more young people are not going on immediately from high school. 
or if they go on and they go for a year or so, drop out for several years, that coupled with the declining birth rate means that uh, if you look into the 80s, uh, the enrollment picture may be somewhat uh, less encouraging than it is at the moment. Uh, would you like to comment on that? I think we're very much aware of this. I think that uh, liberal arts colleges that are nothing, that have nothing, to, that don't, don't have anything very unique, and many of them are trying to get but just the fact that they're a liberal arts college is kind of pretty tough, and many of them are finding enrollments down and uh, meeting tremendous financial problems. I think this could be true of us. If we did not provide unique areas of education. I think that as we see uh, certain courses no longer attracting uh, students, we've got to drop them in favor of inaugurating new ones which are attractive. And this we have been doing successfully. And our RIT over the last couple of years has bucked the trend of declining enrollment and we, although uh, nothing startling, we have increased enrollment in each of the last two years. Well, this is very much contrary to the national trend and I think can be continued if RIT continues to be unique, but not if we just are another college or university. That's right. It is going to be interesting to see how this works out over the years. Well, Arthur, I think we've almost exhausted the other side of this tape. Well, it's been uh, fascinating talking to you. I yeah. think uh, it's fun to reminisce. It really is. I certainly appreciate your being willing to take this time. And uh, this will now become part of the archives. And, uh, <laughs> well, I've enjoyed you're, it you're tremendously. You won't have to eliminate any expletives. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that uh, we did better than Mr. Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs>